I have a uh, children's story this morning, and so if you are a child and you would like to be able to see the pictures, I would invite you to come down front. Any any kids who want to be able to see the pictures of the book? So, I have to tell you, I spent last week in California with a whole group of Unitarian Universalist ministers, and on Friday, two days ago, after on Friday after our the thing we were at ended, a group of us, a group of ministers, decided to go together to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Has anybody ever been to the Monterey Bay Aquarium? And there we saw penguins, and it's very interesting. So you can imagine ministers. We walked around and we were like pretending to be penguins. And it was in front of the penguin exhibit that I said to a friend of mine, I said, I, said, I am leading a multi-generational service on, on family this Sunday, and, and I'm supposed to tell a story, and I don't know what story I'm going to tell. Do you, any of you have any ideas? And, and lo and behold, I was told, do you know that there's a story about families that's also about penguins? We were right in front of the penguin exhibit. And I said, oh, neat. So, so I found this book. There is... A story is called, And Tango Makes Three. And I'll do my best reading upside down while... In the middle of New York City, there is a great big park called Central Park. Children love to play there. It has a toy boat pond where you can sail your own boats. It has a carousel to ride on in the summer and a rink to skate on in the winter. But best of all, it has its very own zoo. And every day, families of all kinds go to the zoo to visit the animals where they live. But the children and their parents aren't the only families at the zoo. The animals make families of their own. There are red panda bear families with mothers and fathers and furry red panda bear cubs. There are uh, monkey dads and monkey moms raising noisy monkey babies. There are toad families and toucan families and cotton top tamarind families too. And in the penguin house, there are penguin families. Every year, at the very same time, the girl penguins start noticing the boy penguins, and the boy penguins start noticing the girl penguins. When the right girl and the right boy find each other, they become a couple. Two penguins in the penguin house were a little bit different, though. One was named Roy, and the other was named Silo. Roy and Silo were both boys, but they did everything together. They bowed to each other and walked together. They sang to each other and swam together. Wherever Roy went, Silo went too. They didn't spend much time with the girl penguins, and the girl penguins didn't spend much time with them either. Instead, Roy and Silo wound their necks around each other. Their keeper, Mr. Gramsay, noticed the two penguins and thought to himself, they must be in love. Roy and Silo watched how the other penguins made a home, and they too followed. And penguins make a home by finding little rocks and making a rock stone nest with little pebbles and rocks. And there you can see Roy and Silo making their own nest with stones. And every morning, Roy and Silo woke up together. But one day, Roy and Silo saw that the other couples were doing something that they couldn't do. The mama penguin would lay an egg. She and the pop penguin would take turns keeping the egg warm until finally it would hatch. And then there would be a baby penguin chick. Do you see the baby penguin chicks right there? We got lots of awes at the first service. Roy and Silo had no egg to sit on, and they had no baby chick to feed and cuddle and love. Their nest was nice, but it was a little empty. One day, Roy found a nice round rock and brought it back to the nest, and Roy and Silo took turns sitting on the rock, (laughs) 
hoping it would one day hatch. But it didn't hatch. And there you can see Roy and Silo sitting and sitting and sitting and sitting. But as you can tell, nothing happened. Then Mr. Gramsci, the zookeeper, got an idea. He found an egg that needed to be cared for, and he brought it to Roy and Silo's nest. Roy and Silo knew just what to do. They moved the egg to the center of their nest, and every day they took turns sitting on it. They sat on it in the morning and at night. They sat through lunchtime and, sw and swim time and supper time. They sat at the beginning of the month and at the end of the month. And all of a sudden, in all of a sudden, they heard a sound coming from the egg. Peep, said the egg. Peep, 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 peep. Roy and Silo called back. Squawk, squawk. Squawk! Peep, 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 answered the egg. The egg began to break, and suddenly a tiny hole appeared, and then, crack, out came their very own baby. She had fuzzy white feathers and a funny black beak, and Roy and Silo were now fathers. We'll call her Tango, the zookeeper decided, because it takes two to make a tango. Roy and Silo taught Tango how to sing for them when she was hungry. They fed her food from their beaks. They snuggled her in the nest at night. Tango was the very first penguin in the zoo to have two daddies. Soon, Tango grew strong enough to leave the nest. Roy and Silo took her for a swim, just like all the other penguin families. And all the children who came to the zoo could see Tango with her two dads playing in the penguin house with the other penguins. Hooray, Roy, they cheered. Hooray, Silo, they cheered. Welcome, Tango, they yelled. At night, the three penguins returned to their nest. There, they snuggled together, and like the other penguins in the penguin house, and all the other animals in the zoo, and all the other families in the big city around them, they went to sleep. Good night. So there is, and this is actually, this is actually a true story about uh, the two penguins, Roy and Silo, and their baby Tango. Here in our church, we have families of all different shapes and sizes, and I wanted to invite uh, a couple of people to come forward and to talk a little bit about their families. And first, we're going to hear from Kathy Cole, and then we're going to hear from Susan McDaniel and Pat Smith. So... When my husband, Steve, and I were about 50 years old, we decided that even though we were getting old, we still wanted children in our lives. A year or so later, after completing all the requirements by social services, we were approved for adoption and met our two girls. They were sisters, 12 and 7 years old, and they needed parents to love and take care of them. We celebrate two special days in our house every year. July 18th is our family day. That's the day that Lindsay and Stephanie came to live with us. December 13th is our adoption day. That's the day our adoption was finalized by the courts, three and a half years after family day. So for three and a half years, according to the law, we were foster parents, and they were foster kids. This meant that they were staying with us only temporarily, according to the law, and that we couldn't be mom and dad, according to the law. Guess what? We decided that we didn't need to wait for the law to tell us when we were a family. We knew that we could be a family by acting like a family, we did everything that your family does. Lindsay and Stephanie started calling us mom and dad. They went to school. Dad went to work. Mom, that's me. I was lucky enough to stay home, but I took care of the house and groceries and meals and laundry and trips to the dentist and soccer practice and all those things. 
And while we were acting like a family, we learned to love each other like a family. So we became a family. Pretty simple, huh? If you act like a family and love like a family, you become a family. Because the most important thing about family is that because of their love for each other, they're always there to help each other. Nobody needs the courts to tell you when you're a family. You know it in your heart. I'm Susan, and this is my wife, Pat. And we're an ordinary family. We've been together a couple for a long time, not as long as a lot of you guys, but a long time just the same. I'm fortunate to have a stepdaughter, and we have very wonderful, of course, grandkids. We have the same day-to-day challenges that every family has. Who's going to cook dinner? Who's going to clean the bathrooms? Who's going to mow the lawn? All that kind of -of run-of-the-mill stuff. And we've had our share of intense life-altering events that come to everyone. Family illness and death, business ups and downs, pets that die unexpectedly, and all the rest that is life. Valentine's Day is coming up, but we don't celebrate it. I don't need one special day a year to tell or show Pat how much I love her, and she doesn't need it from me. We kiss goodbye every morning when one of us leaves. We kiss hello when we return. And perhaps a little kissing and hugging in between. (laughs) We talk about our days, and that is time well spent. We each have different interests, music, quilting, cycling, reading, among others, and spend time doing those. And with a lot of love and learning under our belts and fights, that too, we easily share laughs and good times that last forever. At the risk of overdoing things, I just want to say that we've had some classic fights. (laughs) (laughs) And they have names. They have names. (laughs) My daughter, who's now 42, she remembers those. (laughs) The luggage fight. The luggage fight. That was a big (laughs) one. Yes, we're lesbians. And in the past, that hasn't always been easy. I always like to... I never want to forget how hot it was. Not Maybe not as much for us, but for all gay people. But given the community in which we live, and you're all a big part of that community... The people we work with and the life we've built, we're really just an ordinary family. 